Hi, this is Anne with an anagram to walk you through how I would code up the battleship game um, in chapter two, which is a little bit different than how the book um, asks you to do it. And the book, I really like this book. I think it's a great book to work through in general. Um, I think that they have some limitations as a book that caused some trouble for students in this one beginning exercise. And I'd like to get you started on an approach to code a little, test a little, that this, the book's discussion doesn't support this time around. So um, basically what I'm gonna do is talk simply about um, writing this code that's here on page 52. So look for step one if you've got an e-copy of the book. And um, just to make it not so painful, I already have that code typed in. Um, if Ruffle's talking to me. Okay, so this is just a demo. It doesn't have all the complete images and things from your exercise, but I just wanted to start right here where assume I have, I have understood that, that I gave you the code to up through here. Okay, that's this first part. And then you've typed in this much and this game loop. Um, and the problem here is that the book kind of um, hides the lead in the sense that this is a loop and it's gonna keep running as long as this variable has the value false. And there's, at the moment, there's no code inside the loop to ever change the value of that variable. So in the book discussion, on the page after, it shows you the code to type. At the bottom, there is um, an, a note that says you might be tempted to try this code now, but it'll start an infinite loop. And the thing is, you're going to run into infinite loops occasionally anyway. They just happen naturally in the course of developing. And particularly for them to set you up with code that has an infinite loop and expect you to just keep typing and then only be able to test your code at the end is really not, I think, the most productive way to approach this problem. So I'm going to show you two things that I would just always do in this case. And um, many students have been successful simply following the book, typing super careful, proofreading really carefully, and then testing at the end. But I want to give you a different approach to the development process um, and see if this will work for you. Um, first of all, I always try to get the code to talk to me. Um, the fancy term for this is instrumenting your code. I always think of it as the code should talk to me. So I'm gonna to add to the code the book gave us two lines. The first is one that every time I get into this loop, I would like the code to, to say something down here in the console log. Um, in a previous version of REPL, this black box, the console log, and this preview part over here were two tabs and you had to switch between them. Then at some point in the last um, six months or so, Replit made this nice change where the console log is always visible. And I think that's going to encourage you to do something similar to what I'm doing. So um, I'm going to put in a note that says, okay, every time I hit this line, I'm going to print out in the console. And I'm going to tell myself the value of the guesses variable. Now, your spacing here is, is optional. I kind of like lots of white space. That's who I am. Um, so what I have is I've added a line that every time we, we go through this loop, I'm going to see the value of guesses. Okay. And um, I'm going to take my heart in my hands and go ahead and test this code the way the book tells you not to. And you're going to see an infinite loop in practice. Okay. And I believe, and I'm going to have to close this. Um, I probably have to close this browser window once I get to the infinite loop um, and then reopen it. So you'll have to be patient with that. 
Um, so here we go. I'm going to hit the run button, which the book tells you not to do. And what you're going to see down here is what an infinite loop looks like um, in practice. Um, unless, of course, I have a typo, which, um, oh yeah, that was intentional. That I borrowed a typo from a student I was working with. So um, before we see our infinite loop, let's fix our code. And this is another reason why you really want to be testing almost every line or every few lines that you type in, because it's easy to make typos. Now, when you are more experienced with Replit, you would probably notice that some of this text is red, and that's what strings should look like, and some of this text is not red, okay? But really, at this stage in your process and getting to know Replit, you may not notice that, and you might not even, even if I told you to look at it, it might take you a while to see that. So in the meantime, when I run this code, um, I'm seeing an error message, and it's really important to understand how to read this. This tells me the file name that the, um, that the, the, the file that the error is in. This is the line number where the interpreter first realizes there's a problem. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And then this is the character. Now, the line number is, is helpful, but often not exact. In this case, it's exact. There really is a syntax error right in that line. Oftentimes, the error is either in a line above where the error is recognized, or it's in code that calls a function where the error is recognized. But in this case, my interpreter is saying that there's an error on line 29, okay, and that there's a missing parenthesis after an argument list. And that, that specific error message isn't very helpful What's really happening here, and most of you have been probably tapping on the glass trying to show me what was wrong, is that I've got an open quote and a close quote in the middle of my string, and then what the interpreter and the IDE are seeing is a new open quote here. So use your colors to notice things. Get rid of that extra double quote. And now I've got ready, aim, fire like that. Now, I'm going to take a quick timeout, once again, postpone showing you the infinite loop to try something. I'm going to take this URL for this code exactly as it is and try something that I should have tried yesterday with a student. So let me see if I can get, I'm using Chrome. Um, and generally speaking, for this course, Chrome and Firefox are, um, are absolutely equivalent and you're welcome to use either one. But I noticed yesterday with a student that he was getting very different error messages for the same code. So now I've moved in a window of Chrome, uh, I mean, of, I'm sorry, a window of Firefox with that same code in that same broken state. And if I hit my run button over here, yeah, that's interesting. See how I'm getting the same error message, but no line number? And that's not like wicked super helpful. Um, so um, the browser wars mean that these browsers compete. They are always slightly different. We mostly ignore those differences. But it would appear to me that at the moment, in the, you know, and this will change, this could change next week, that the error messages from Chrome, where I'm getting the same error, but I am getting a location for it, are more useful than the errors in Firefox. Um, so you might consider that in your choice of browser to use for development. Um, and again, it's personal choice. But now I've at least solved the problem of why the student was seeing a very different error message than I was when I was helping. Okay, so back to, back to the code in the way I want to work on it. So let's go ahead and fix this error again. Okay, and now I believe if I run this, you're going to see an infinite loop in practice. 
All right, an infinite loop with a prompt in the middle. So if I hit OK, you're stuck. OK, now in this case, because we've got a prompt, I've got also got a cancel key. And I'm thinking that might help. No. OK, so I'm just I'm just as host as I can be. I'm sort of stuck here with this line. And unfortunately, this console log line is not showing up probably until I were able to get out of here somehow. And I don't seem to be able to get out of here. So the only thing I can do is I, I could certainly close my browser and reopen it. But I might be able to go over here and hit this button to reload the page. So let's try that. That's a little less radical. No, not helping. OK, so oh, helping. Okay, that took a minute, but that didn't finally reload the, key, the code and the run button hasn't been pushed. Okay, so that infinite loop is why the book says you can't test your code at this point. So, but that's never true, it's your code and you can make it do what you want. So what I'm gonna do is add a comment and a line of code that makes this not run in an infinite loop. Okay, so. Okay, so I'm gonna add a line of code that, that leave this at the bottom. Everything else you do when you're coding book code that's inside the loop should go above this line, but I'm gonna add an is sunk equals true here. Okay, so we start with is sunk equal to false. Okay, when is sunk is false, we run the code in here. And now every time we get to the bottom of this quote unquote loop, we're setting is sunk equal to true. And that means that the loop will terminate. Okay, and then I'm just gonna, again, I do more of this than most people do. But I just like to know where my code gets to. Okay, so now I've got a console log that we never got to see before, but it'll be useful as you do your as you do your work. I've got a prompt that should run only once because the first time I'm through this loop, I'm setting the control variable is sunk to true, and that means I won't run through the code a second time. So if I got that all right. I'm going to hit the run button here. Okay, get a prompt. Okay, and then hit okay again. And you'll see the two lines of console logging that the that when we were stuck in the loop with the prompt, we weren't getting to see. We see that we're in the guess in the game loop and guess is equals zero. And then the game loop is over. Okay. And um even after you remove this for the debugging, and you're basically looking for the code that would set is sunk equal to true naturally as the game plays, once you get rid of this, then you'll start seeing this guess count increment. But what you want to see as you go through, and let's just take a quick look at the book, okay? Um, we just did this code and found a way to run it, find a syntax error, and test it, okay? Here's an explanation of how prompt works and what it should look like, and now you've seen that for yourself, okay? And now um, we have the code we're supposed to add. The book is pretty good about this. Um, you'll see the code you're supposed to add in a gray block, okay? One of the things that Two things that are very hard about this about this exercise for students is knowing where to add the new code. And I think if you look at the context around the gray blocks, you, that shouldn't be so hard, okay? Um, and then the other is, to, well, I mean, it's hard to type code in, right? Um, and I should note that the better typist you are and the better speller you are, the more you are going to probably have trouble
typing in code to start with. Okay, this camel case will not come naturally to your fingers. Okay, and you may find yourself with spaces inside words that like variable names that should not be there. Um, and, and there may be ways that we spell things like, um, oh, I know one. I get any number of people who just reflexively type out that whole word which is not the same as the var keyword, okay? So if you're a good speller, if you're a good typist in particular, you're gonna find that your fingers are automatically doing things like is sunk instead of what your, what your brain is gonna think of as pretty strange, okay? And these, each of these things will generate its own bizarre error message. So if you type this, again, you get this unexpected identifier, that's a pretty generic error message, but it's at line 27. And you can look at line 27 and see if you can identify what's wrong. If you're having trouble, I, if you're looking at a line and you're looking at a line and you're having trouble seeing what's wrong with it, my recommendation is try to read it backwards as opposed to forwards. When you read forwards or you read from the top of your code to the bottom of your code, your reader brain takes over and, you're, and, and everything about how we teach ourselves to read is that we fill in the blanks and we use context clues and we, and we glue meaning together very quickly. And you know what you intended to write for code. So when your reader brain is working, you're going to read what you intended, okay? So what you need to do is learn to turn on your coder brain and see what you wrote and not what you intended. And I find that one of the most powerful ways to do that is try to look at code backwards or from the bottom to the top because it slows your brain down and makes you look at what's there instead of what you intended to write. Okay, so um, to go back to the book a minute, this is the next chunk of code you're gonna act. See the gray block, okay. And then, um, unfortunately, the book is not, the book is pretty good. It's showing you again, here in the gray block is the new code. And notice that that's inside this same set of curly brackets that guesses plus one is equal to n. And then, there's a place, yeah. Um, the one place where the book's a little, um, inconsistent is you added hits equal hits plus one in this gray block and I would have thought the gray block here should start below that line because in general the gray blocks are just for the code you're adding. Um, but again, make sure you don't have double and triple copies of code. That's what one of the things I see a lot is just lots of random lines of code top, typed in but multiple versions of it or in the wrong location. So just re pay really close attention to this and also to these versions of pseudocode and to the special slide I have that kind of breaks down how the pseudocode translates into the brackets. Um, but again, if you have keep this line in place, these two lines in place, as you type in the code, you're gonna be in a position to test this line once it's written, test these two lines so you can run your code twice, once with a that invalid guess and once with a valid guess. You can add your hit detection and at least see that you haven't broken the code, that you're not getting any syntax errors. And you can add this code and actually play the game all the way to the point of getting an alert. Now, at the point that you finally add this line, where is sunk gets set to true naturally once you have three hits, that's the point at which you will want to be sure and go back and get rid of this because then you need the code to be running multiple times and you want the loop to work again. I hope that helps. Let me know if you have questions. Take care.